Welcome in for another episode of the Vitamin C's podcast, proud part of the CLNS Media Network. Um, I am your host, Tim Shields, and I'm joined by my co-host and partner in crime today, Wayne Breezy Brown. Uh, we're just getting to you. This is going to be, by the time this comes out, the f- hopefully final game of the NBA Finals will be played. I'm rooting for the Nuggets. Um, I called Nuggets in five before the series started, so I feel pretty solid about that tonight. Uh, we talked about it before we hopped on. Tyler Hero is, you know, marked as, what, questionable for tonight. I think he's yeah. going to be a decoy if he plays. But in terms of Celtic stuff, we've got a lot of good stuff to get into. A lot of positive stuff for the most part. we got one kind of bad, sort of bad thing, and two good things. Before we crack into that, what are you know how we doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I'm excited to talk about some of the the new Celtics news. Uh, I'm curious to know what this bad thing might be. It's going to throw me for a little curveball, I think. I'm not sure what we consider being bad at this moment. But listen, I'm happy the offseason is pretty much here. The The draft is coming up soon, uh, and, and deals will be made so very shortly. So I'm excited to see what's going to transgress for the Boston Celtics. Yeah, and I know... Um the big thing for me when I talk about bad news, and I, I only say this is bad news because it, it means that they've been dealing with this issue for a long time, but Grant Williams having to get surgery obviously ah, sucks. Okay. So he ended up getting surgery on his left hand, and I believe I'd have to pull up exactly what it was because it was a very specific surgery, but I saw a video of him running into like someone on the street and they did some kind of video, and he was talking about, yeah, you know, like, how did you guys lose the heat? And he's like, I don't know. I'm still asking myself the same question. But, you know, I think they're going to be taken care of in a day or two, so it's going to be fine. But he had his whole arm wrapped up in a sling and his uh, two fingers like this, almost looking like, like a finger gun sort of thing. Um, and that was all in some kind of brace. So he was dealing with this kind of serious injury for a while. Apparently, he got that in March, and it kind of just continued to bother him. The only thing that's weird for me is, The report that came out um, from The Athletic, from Jared Weiss, uh, said he was having an issue in his shooting arm. So I don't know. That's his right arm because he's a righty, I believe. So that's what I was told before. So I don't know if it was misreporting. It wasn't his shooting arm. It's, in fact, his left arm. I, I, I don't know. I thought he was a righty, unless I'm, like, hallucinating. Um, <laughs> I don't think you're hallucinating, but uh, so, I I mean, well, I guess that is the bad news. But the good news about the bad news is that the surgery was successful. And so he had his surgery. It was a repair to a tear of the radio collateral ligament of the third meta carpophalangeal joint on his left Gesundheit. hand. <laughs> <laughs> I could see you looking it up. I was like, I'm like I was about phalangeal. to pull it up. I'm glad you found Well, I remember it was a mouthful. So it was a hand injury. <laughs> on his left hand. Okay. So, what, so was it just a misreporting the first time? Or I think he, it was a he, misreporting. That's what this, I think. It's yeah. the only thing that makes sense. It's got to be the left arm. It's got to all be one thing. It's the only one that makes logical sense. I wonder if that affected, if it's not a shooting arm, but what does that affect his gather, maybe? Maybe him just getting ready to shoot, I wonder. I wonder if this is why he passed up on a lot of opportunities, that, you know, just having an injury. You know, when you're injured, we don't talk about the mental aspect that it plays on your team. And sometimes mm-hmm. physically you can go out there and outperform the injury, right? Like you can physically manage the pain, but then there's that mental aspect, and then there's players that can get through the mental aspect, but physically, we watched Jason Tatum. He was mentally tough, but he couldn't physically come land on that leg, right? Like, it, it was it was bothering him. Every time he went up, he grimaced, you know, embracing the landing. And so, you know, it's interesting, you know, and I don't like to say we lose because of injuries or things like that. I mean, it's part of the game. It's going to happen uh, in the game because basketball, believe it or not, it's one of the most physical games played, uh, mm-hmm. believe it or not. And so, you know, luckily, like I said, this was a, to, per this report, this was the left hand. Uh, I'm going to try that one more time. OK, the third metacarpophalangeal joint. In his on his left hand, I just wanted to try to say that again. <laughs> I know it's in the hand. I don't know exactly where that is, but I'm glad that it got operated on and that he's doing better. Yeah. Uh, that that is the positive spin on this, right? Is that it's been operated on, it's taken care of. The only thing that I'm wondering is how much this impacts his free agency. He's not talking. I've seen 
some brief clips of him talking since then. And the clip that I mentioned before where like a random fan runs. I'm watching it right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. (laughs) It was a funny, it's like only like a minute long. It was a funny clip. I ended up finding it like last night or something. That's a big finger gun too, by the way. That's like a 40 cal finger gun. That's what I'm saying. Like that's like a, that was a deagle. (laughs) It's a big one. A deagle, right? (laughs) It's it's fully encased like his fingers. So, I mean, it must have been something in between the joints. That's all I can think of it must have been. But it's anyway. on his left hand, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's at, all the left hand. It's on the left hand. <laughs> so it's a misreporting, and it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. But I do so, wonder how this impacts free agency. He doesn't, ta- he doesn't seem to be talking like a guy who's looking to leave. No, and not at all, which is good I, for the Celtics, in my the, opinion. No, I, I agree. I don't think... I don't think moving on from him is the answer. I don't think he was the problem. Him falling out of the rotation we've talked about so much was just kind of stupid and not really explained. I don't know if this I wonder factored if it was an injury, it. though. It could... But nah, I, don't know. I, I, nah. have to look at, I have to look at the minutes right before March leading I, into that. I think it was just more of our head coach having brain drain. Like, yep. that sounds bad, and I, I'll say pause, but that's what it was. Like, like he didn't know. He didn't know what to do. Uh, and and when, when his back was against the wall, you go with Grant, because what else do you have to lose? It, it's funny when you're playing with, you know, what else do you have to lose type of factor. And, you you know, whatever happens, happens. And you got we got really great minutes from Grant Williams in that last series, if I'm not mistaken. I thought his minutes were excellent. Uh, were there times he played like the indecisive Grant Williams where he would kind of like pump fake and then try to dribble and get around? I'm like, Grant, just shoot the damn ball. Like, just shoot it. If it goes in, it goes in. Yes. If it doesn't, no problem. There'll be guys there to try to rebound for you, but once Grant gets that mental capacity down to just shoot your shot, Grant, he's a three-point shooter. He can hit, especially from the corner. We watch him occasionally pull up, hit the hit the pull-up three. I'll be like, don't shoot that one. And then that one goes in, but he won't take the wide open ones in the corner. But I feel like, in my opinion, Tim, that Grant is the new Marcus Smart. And if you remember Marcus Smart during his earlier days, he was tremendous on defense wasn't giving you much of an offensive uh much offensive production but he was a a nagaboo and he made sure that he got the ball back he made right plays uh he's not getting paid top dollar for a point guard in the the league but he got paid enough to be and remain with the boston celtics and I, i feel like grant uh, Williams is on that same trajectory. I almost had a slight pause where I called him Grant Hill. I know I've been doing better. <laughs> You've been so good. You've been so good for so long now. It's been like at least like a month and a half since I heard Grant Hill come out of your mouth. That I've never, I haven't heard you say it since then. It, honestly, it's been like two months. I don't know if you heard the pause. It was, it was, it was there. I just, was I just pregnant. Made... It was a very, <laughs> it was a long pause. It was a moment of registration there. <laughs> There's only one Grant, damn it. I'm sorry. Well, the one that matters at least. Right. But But with Grant specifically, I feel like the three-point specialist is kind of what he's at. And when he tries to play outside of that role is when things kind of get complicated. He added these nice little wrinkles to his offensive game, but sometimes he kind of got tunnel vision. So maybe factoring into... He got the injury, right? But I think maybe leading into that, he kind of was in a cold stretch. So I think, you know, he was playing out of his role, wasn't playing to the role that, you know, Joe wanted him in. And then so that kind of like led to less minutes. He got injured. And then it was like, okay, now we have to go about managing this injury that's pretty significant that he chose to play through. So it wasn't something that like, oh, we don't know if this is going to be a problem long term. No, he chose to play through that injury that could have very well meant to get that operated on and be done for the year. So uh, more power to him for playing through that. And I don't think I don't think a guy who was planning to leave um, would jeopardize the chance to like get healthy before the off season if he was going to leave because I think now obviously you know you made you made it to game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals you, it was still somewhat felt like a left down or a letdown but I feel like if he was fully healthy going into this off season he would have a better chance of getting more money if he was trying to leave so I I. I'm just trying to read tea leaves here. I, I know this is a super positive spin on it. I just think that if it were a situation like, screw this, I don't want to make this injury any worse. I want to get it operated on now so I don't have to worry about this in the summer. 
that's probably what I would imagine he would have done. But may, maybe that payday is there regardless. But yeah, uh, maybe maybe losing was a gift in in a, in a way because he's not the only player. I feel like that's dealing with a nagging injury. And Tatum's got to get that wrist. Tatum's got to get the wrist fixed. He's yeah. just got to get it done. It always yeah. comes back to haunt him. Mm-hmm. And so why not take this time? You've had some time off. Take the time. Get the wrist surgery. And then we'll see what happens after that. But, but you know what? That's easier said than done. You're talking about a shooter and them, and them operating on your wrist. That's not an easy mental thing to think about. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the mm-hmm. only time I want to get a damn spinal tap is if I'm sick and I can't do any other thing. Yeah, to, to do this. I mean, other than that, if I know and I'm not sick, you're not taking a spinal tap. You're not touching my back. But when I'm on my bed and I might be on my way out and you got to get that bone, you know, spinal tap. Hell yeah. I'm about to die anyway. Might as well go ahead and do it. <laughs> so for like Tatum, you know, I'm, I'm hoping he goes ahead and, and finds a way to get that wrist surgery. But I wanted to ask you this hypothetical comparison about uh, about Grant Williams, right? Let me okay. ask you this question. If you could get P.J. Tucker on your team, would you do it? I mean, depends what version of pj tucker and what age if you get the you i mean you're getting let's say you get prime pj tucker that's just a damn nag in your face defensively are you saying in terms of comparing him to like uh, what Grant could you be? weren't supposed to try to figure out what the hell i was trying to i, compare, I get what you're yeah, saying but, yeah i, I think, know but you know where i'm going with it <laughs> well you know who i've always kind of compared and i don't know if this is a fair comparison or if it's an accurate one but in my mind i always kind of thought of grant williams as kind of like a baby boris diao or okay. he's got the body to defend. Boris. But yeah, like, so Boris was like a big enough guy to like play some center minutes, but generally played at like the four and could bang the three. And like he could move for like a big guy. And I don't know. I feel like that's kind of like the role that I can imagine Grant in, especially when like you look at Dio when he was with the Spurs and like wrapped up his career there, where he just like played that perfect little role that you needed him to play. Mm-hmm. I think that's ultimately what you get out of Grant. And, I, I think that's why when they're going to be doing this roster shuffle, because they're going to have to do something, um, especially with the CBA stuff coming up. But I, I don't think that they're going to try and move on from Grant. I think you try and keep him if you can. Uh, obviously, you have to worry about the matching situation, but you don't got to worry about matching if you give him an offer and he agrees to it and you it get is. it done. And then that's that. And you could start negotiating, I believe, on June 30th. June so 30th is the date, correct. That I'm expecting for a lot of talks to come out about Grant and the Celtics, around JB and the Celtics. Uh, and I, uh, on, until that happens, though, like they kind of are in a holding pattern. Like We're not yeah. really going to hear any other news unless someone says, I want to get the hell out of here. And fortunately, we have not heard that yet. But what we have heard in regards to what you said before about brain drain, we got a couple new coaches. We already talked about Sam Cassell on our last episode. I thought that Sam Cassell was going to be the lead assistant, but apparently I, I, that's not the case. But but I did too. Mm-hmm. And so they made their new hire. Charles Lee. Charles Lee. Don't put the Ray on it at the end. He's no, he's not Chucky. He is, you know, he's a, a great defensive minded coach that I feel like the Celtics need. Right. They need their defensive mind back into their array of coaching. Uh, and so, it, and, and this is what it does. Uh, I think, I can't remember who put out this dope kind of like trajectory of the three coaches that they have so far, but, you mm-hmm. know, they, they kind of talked about uh, um, our head coach, Missoula, with the offense, and then you get Lee with the defense, and then you just get that. Cassell with the passing. The pass. With like the ball moving the, the guard. You get play. what I'm saying? Like, just the, just the, I don't want to say the fundamentals of basketball, but what the freak? The fundamentals, like the, the right stuff, the, the, the good old new kids on the block stuff that you <laughs> need from these basketball players. No, because every game, we might not mention this, but we have issues with basketball IQ yep. from players. Mm-hmm. And I and, and and I think you know without mentioning any of the players' names, I think with Sam Cassell is you you bring the coaching IQ that can bring it back to the basics, that can keep simple, stupid, and that can allow players to get to their max potential. And I think that's what Cassell does. And then you you get Lee that's going to bring you that defensive intensity, which is something that we lacked. We saw it when they pushed the button, though they pushed the button. My only question is they didn't push it in Game Seven. And, and and maybe because they ran out of gas again? I don't know. But it just didn't even seem like the same defensive intensity was there that they had in the prior games when their backs were against the wall. 
I, I think the issue with that was is like you lose Tatum twenty six seconds in twenty six seconds right out right out the gate and i think that just kind of throws everything into a spiral they like i think i want to say that they start off the game like 11 to 4 or 11 to 6 they couldn't hit anything and, from the three bro it was and tough. it just it just got ugly so like part of it was jalen and the turnovers it's very clear that he's got issues going left i don't again i've speculated before that it might have something to do with that left wrist issue that he had a few years back so that's entirely a possibility my thinking is once they kind of lost Tatum there. They lost one one of their better defenders. People don't realize it necessarily off the bat, but because of his size, his length, his ability to defend multiple positions, Tatum has taken a big step up in that regard. Um, and he's vocal. So, so and that the way he And the way he plays lanes, if you want to add that to length, but the way he plays the lanes, he's able to get you a few steals when you're not yeah, expecting pick them. them. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It, and so like he factors into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always love using that term. I know it's a football term, so I know no, you love ain't. that too. No, it ain't. Not anymore. Not anymore? I, we know because, look, J- I, you know what? As much as I don't like Jimmy Butler because he plays for the opposing team, he plays safety very well. He's he sat hawk. there and played mental football, uh, basketball against the uh, the offense. Who's going to be passing the ball? And he would play that lane and, and aid and abed you to, th- to, th- to throw it because he's going to anticipate it and jump it. Tatum does the same thing, but Tatum is more, <laughs> he's more, because of his size, he can stay in a spot and you're like, damn, I got to either get it around him, over him or whatever. And he has that ability to just pick it out of air, pick it from the side. So Tatum mm-hmm. has a gift at that and playing lanes. Yeah. And well, and I think, Part of that, so because it affects you on offense, it impacts your defense, impacts the way you can get back. So I think it kind of screwed them all up. And because you don't have the coaching there to adjust, you, we've talked so much about the coaching staff getting gutted. And I think that just made a huge difference in what they were able to do. Like in terms of schemes and stuff like that, you don't... Joe Mazzullo is a good coach. Um, he's still very green. And... That's not a knock on him. It's just an acknowledgement of the fact of he got thrown into an impossible situation. And then about halfway through the season, he lost Damon Stoudemire, who was his top assistant, um, to a to a head coaching job uh, at the collegiate level. So, like, good for him. Like, that's awesome. But you, you're you losing guys left and right. And I think because of that, you fail to adjust. You fail to adapt because you just – you're, you're getting handed a whole new set of circumstances that you were not anticipating going into the season. So – the, the hires they've made so far have been really good. Cassell having player experience is good. Uh, and Charles Lee is really interesting because I don't know if I, I totally blanked on this. And now looking back, it totally makes sense. As I say, totally one more time. Totally. Totally. You're like a Ninja Turtle totally. right now. Totally. totally. Um, so he was part of their coaching search way back when they hired Udoka. Charles Lee was on their radar. And he's been on the radar of a lot of teams over the past few years. Um, So when the Pelicans were looking to fill their coaching position, he was one of the candidates that they looked at. When the... uh, most recently, the Raptors and the Pistons. Um, he was in the in the running for both of those spots. Um, my thinking is Steven Silas went to Detroit to sign on to be the lead assistant under Monty Williams. I think the reason that was the case was because the Celtics were eyeing Charles Lee over him. And I think Silas knew that. And that might have been why. Or maybe they just were going to bring him on as an assistant, but they weren't going to give him the lead assistant job because they had the intention of giving it to a guy like Charles Lee. That's just, again, this is me spitballing reading the situation. But. Interesting take. Because if I'm not mistaken, did Charles Lee turn down head coaching positions? Because I believe he was in the realms for some of those as well. He was, but he wasn't chosen. That was the thing. So he was in the running for Detroit. Detroit ended up going with Monty Williams and signing him to a historic deal. I think okay. it was the biggest coaching contract in NBA history. Which okay wild to me not that he's bad it's just like that's crazy to me that that was like the one to set the record you know and on top of that uh i can't remember the guy's name um off the top of my name uh, top of my head uh but rapper's position got filled and within 24 hours we saw charles lee join the celtics so he got eyed by the raptors the pistons um he also was actually up for the hawks position when it opened mid-season so when quinn snyder took the gig it was him quinn and one other coaching wow. candidate so okay. like he, he's been in serious consideration for a long time and i think the bucks when they were looking at their coaching position he was in consideration he was. as well he, he was um, 
he was the lead assistant under Mike Budenholzer. Mike Budenholzer, there you go. Yeah, and so he started off, he played four years overseas, went to school, I believe, at Bucknell. He went back to Bucknell after playing four years overseas professionally and coached as an assistant coach for Bucknell for two seasons, then moved to the NBA, was an assistant coach uh, for the Atlanta Hawks, was there for the last two years of Al Horford's time in Atlanta, um, served so four years in Atlanta, then went on, 2018 joined the Milwaukee Bucks, was with them uh, when they won their championship, and now he joined the Celtics. So it's a lot of well-rounded experience coming together, and it's good because I think between him and Cassell, you got two guys who are getting eyed for head coaching positions multiple times now. And granted, like they didn't get picked for them, but they're being in consideration. You don't just consider anyone for head coaching jobs. And it's really, really difficult. Like it might just be entirely subjective and preferential. You know, you're looking at what do the players want? What does the GM want? What's the owner want? What are we looking for? Like you have to check certain boxes and if you don't, you just don't get hired and like it might be tough. You lose out on a job, but look at it now. The way that I'm trying to shape it up too is Charles Lee's with the Celtics and I think that's good for everybody involved. Um, and there's a lot of experience there between those all oh, three yeah, of those between, guys now. Yeah, especially especially Cassell and, and Charles Lee. Like the experience mm. is crazy. You got a couple of championships, one as a player. Not sure if Cassell, if Cassell won any as, in, in his coaching realm. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so, so either. But you just talked about Charles Lee uh, winning one in Milwaukee. So you're going to get that experience. And, and then I, I think these are going to be two coaches that Coach Missoula can just fall back and trust. At the end mm-hmm. of the day, I mean, you're a head coach. You know, you trust your guys, and we're not. We haven't really sat and talked about the, um, you know, the leave of absence, or you know, of 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 Dana Stoudemire like leaving like abruptly, like just like that. I mean, he got a new position, he took it, he ran with it, happy for him. We 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 didn't really get a chance to kind of like like digress and break that down, like and how much that would factor in because we're just thinking. The head coach, the head coach got it. He'll he'll do. It. That's a that was a lot on his plate. And I apologize to Coach Missoula for not recognizing that he didn't have. He had help, but it wasn't like that trusted. He he had what was left to email. There it is. And like that was that's it, what I was man. going to say. That's he, what it was. He, he had, had the, the leftovers. Yeah, yeah, it was Ben Sullivan, um, Miles, and they're gone, and then, right? Yeah, and, yeah. So he like had gone, the leftovers. Like, yeah. yeah, so I and mean, you can tell that they want, didn't want to be there. I mean, clearly because now look where they are. They're in Houston. <laughs> they wanted to be with Ime. Ime is the reason why they got hired. None of those guys were there with Boston before that happened. I Joe never is the this, bro. I I didn't really think of it either because I didn't really. When you put it in context, right? You think back to everything that happened, like only a few days before camp kicked off. So it happened like tail end of the summer. You're right. Everything hit the fan. So You're like right. from a we 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 talk about the players and we talk about you know everything that was going on with them mentally you know with Ime's departure or suspension at least at the time uh, we didn't know for sure if he was going to come back correct but it, from a coaching perspective like that's the guy who brought you on like that's the guy that you have a relationship with and now all of a sudden like oh Joe Missoula is taking over so like that was a whole thing in itself and I think part of it also. I wonder if Damon Stoudemire was like, well, I'm not going to be able to come a head coach here. I was getting ready to get into those, those type Roadblock. of scenarios. I didn't yeah. want to go down that lane, but he might have felt that way. We don't know. We haven't talked to him. We'd love <laughs> to try to get him on the show, though. But here's the thing. That could have been a situation. And then let's factor in the other guys. When they, they might have came out and they might, they might have felt some type of way that, you know, Stevens chose him over them. Chose this guy. Yeah. yeah. And so there's not resentment is not the word, but jealousy, envy, like that stuff is real uh, and it takes place. And then when you see how quickly they departed and went with their guy, I don't know. It's conspiracy theory 101, but it's it's my conspiracy. I love it. I'm not going to stop because it, it didn't. <laughs> I make don't sense hate it, then. man. Right. But it, I, I'm just putting the puzzle together. And so I'm glad. Let me ask you this question. Does does Joe have any Say so and the processing of what's going down, or is this all good? That is an interesting wrinkle because um, the impression that I've gotten is like I'm sure they're consulting him on it, but I think Brad might be the one who's going out and getting these guys. Interesting. I don't know for sure, though. 
I so I only think this because I ended up editing an uh, episode of Celtic Speed the other day that just dropped. By the way, with Keith Smith talks about the CBA ramifications, so check that out. Oh, uh, that's those why guys you said are there's awesome. going to be some new things going on with the CBA. Got gotcha. Oh yeah, yeah. CBA is going to be really, really tricky with a lot of stuff. But in, in terms of the new hirings, I think they suggested on that that it was Brad Stevens making these decisions and going and hiring these guys. So see, see, that's interesting because. From a football perspective, usually the head coach gets to pick his coaches. But I'm not sure if basketball works like that. I think it does because, I mean, Ime went and picked out his coaches. I'm wondering if, like, Joe is in on the process, but Brad Stevens is ultimately like, hey, I think we should go get these guys. And, like, that's, like, what it is. Uh, I don't know if it makes Joe feel any kind of pressure where it's like, uh, I feel like I'm looking over my shoulder now because you went ahead and micromanaged. Yeah. It's not even micromanaged. It's just, you have guys who are really, really talented, right? Guys who have, again, been considered for head coaching positions that are now behind you on your staff. And does it put a little bit more pressure on you? I like that. As a head coach. Yeah. It's possible. So, so maybe Brad is, Applying a little bit of pressure. Guys that are clearly candidates for coaching. I tell you what, when the Celtics win next year, I guarantee you both of them will be gone. I guarantee. I, mean, I hope not. You never I, know. You never they'll know. Be, they'll be gone. I won't, I won't Charles say Lee, that. Charles Lee and Sam Cassell will get head coaching jobs. And what's with, with, with the coach for Detroit? He'll be fired again, right? I don't, he gets fired like every two years. You ever notice that? Monty Williams, him. There's another one. They, like they just get fired every two years. Dwayne they could Casey. Be, yeah, they could be Dwayne winning. Dwayne Casey got fired from Detroit. Yeah, and Monty and Toronto, right? Like they could be yeah. winning and have winning seasons, and and next thing you know, they're gone. I don't know what that's about, but it's crazy. It, it, it's a coaching thing. Like it's an issue in the NBA. I know that players have talked about it, but specifically, like Eric Spolster was talking about it because it was in the middle of the playoffs where we saw Monty Williams get fired from Phoenix. Uh, Frank Vogel was coming, taking his place, and Monty was not out of work for long. Nor should he be. He's experienced. He's a, he you, won bro. Coach of the Year like what a year or two ago. That's my point. So you know, <laughs> but you look at all the Coach of the Year winners. How many have been fired over the past That's, few years? So so maybe. Maybe the we Dwayne never Casey won. one was fine because it was. I think it was questionable that he won. Like he deserved to win it, but okay. like there were guys who were in the same airspace as him that okay. could have won it, but right. then he got canned. Some of these guys they run their course, but it's not. It, we're in the era of player movement and players impacting team franchises, Facts. like the directions star, and stuff. Star players got to put star that word power. in front of it. Star power. I tell you what, I don't want Missoula to ever win Coach of the Year then. Yeah, I don't know if it's the kiss of death, but it's certainly – I don't know, man. Uh, it just – because the team – listen, the team, because of the star power and the talent on this team, is always going to be a contender. Let me, let me, re, let me, re, let me remind you that Jason Tatum uh, – and I'm, I'm hoping that they find a way to extend Jalen Brown. I don't – it does not make any sense. I don't care how bad Brown played. It doesn't make any sense to break that up. That that's dumb. That, yeah. that you would have to start over. Like like that's silly. Right? Only do it if you have to. Only really do it if it you ha- like if you have to. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to that. Uh, we have that star power. If I can add anything to our roster, it would be one or two grit players. And then a you keep saying I, 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 give me somebody that could just shoot the three, and it yeah, ain't you want Sam another Howell. movement shooter. That's you got, it. You want somebody like that. Find yeah. the next Ray Allen. That's and I'm and I know y'all don't <laughs> tall like order, that. tall order, but <laughs> I mean that is tall, right? But my it's, point is find some. I mean it was it was Ray Allen, it was JJ Redick. Who's the next guy? You want like a guy like JJ because JJ was taking small money towards the end of his career, or like Kyle Korver. Kyle Korver is a perfect example of that. So Just want give a me shooter. one of them dudes, man. Just I, they ain't got plenty of defense. Just sharpshoot, and I know people keep saying, "Yo, we got Sam Hauser. He ain't there yet. He's not there yet." I don't know if it's about he, there yet or just like not given the role. Like he was given a role, and then it was kind he of was, just like weaned off. He was uh, he was the hottest uh, shooter the first like three months of the season. I just, I, so he was a bucket I getter. I, my point is, I don't think he has. 
He doesn't fight screens like them three guys that that we just mentioned. He doesn't fight like he doesn't get open. There's like levels that. to it. He needs to. There, there are certain go. things he needs to add to his game. So I'm saying he's not yeah. there. Not saying he can't get there. I'm yeah. not saying he's not that guy. But give me a proven guy. Because that's what we were missing. Listen, when Jalen Brown couldn't hit a three, Tatum couldn't hit a three, man, golly, why didn't we just put Sam Hauser in the game if he could just hit the – because that Again, was the issue. coaching. Uh, you never yeah. know with the rotational stuff. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. I know. But... I know. I'm shutting up. I'm up. I'm up. <laughs> no, you're good, man. No, I'm opening up wounds. Are people going to watch the show and be like, shut up, Breezy. And I'm like, I know. I know. <laughs> Someone's got to say it, though. Someone's got to say it. Uh, with that, is there anything else we got for us today, Wayne? No, nah, man. I, like I said, every time something new pops up, I'm excited to talk about it because it's Boston Celtics, man. And if you guys haven't known, we love this team. It's unfortunate that we're not playing for that that championship. And and, and I will say this: I hope this I hope it's over tonight. Like I, I'm hoping I'm hoping it's done, uh, and so that we can just close this chapter of the NBA season and really look forward to the future. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, well, we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, this again was another episode of the vitamin C's podcast, proud part of the CLNS media network. We'll catch you next time. Cheers. Sign up at fanduelcom slash Boston and make every moment more on America's number one sports book.